to 2 Kings chapter 3. It's interesting, we read some things in the book of Kings and the book of Chronicles, uh, First and Second Chronicles, First and Second, First and Second Kings. It gives us instruction, it gives us some idea, it gives us some historical events and some things that took place in the nation of Israel as they developed uh, from the time that they went back into uh, uh, Israel, uh, into the nation of Israel, uh, after uh, the exile or after the, uh, the time in Exodus and, uh, and how the kings reacted and so forth. And, and so sometimes we don't get a whole lot in those. We, we read them and they kind of become like newspaper stories and, uh, you know, well, that's good. You know, that's them back there. But, you know, I believe if we read uh, and when we, we get into it, we can find some principles by which we can live by, some principles that God wants to show us and instruct us uh, for our life today. And so here, just a little background, Ahab was the, uh, the Bible tells us he was the most wicked king of all the nation of Israel. Uh, that he did things, and, and his wife was Jezebel. Well, you heard about Jezebel. Uh, they instituted much of the Baal worship or false god worship in the nation of Israel. They built altars to false gods, and they had, they had all kinds of hideous things in, in form of worship. Uh, and, and so uh, that was their uh, notoriety, if you would. Now, King Ahab passes on, uh, as do all men, uh, and so his son, uh, Jehoram, takes over, and he becomes the king. Well, uh, as, as things have it, there are times when some of these kings would invade other uh, regions, and they would make those regions servitude to them. And so Ahab had gone into Moab and made Moab a servant community or servant country to them. And so he, the king of Moab, would send a hundred thousand sheep every year to Israel, to the king of Israel. And he would send the wool of a hundred thousand rams to Israel. Well, when Ahab passes on, the king of Moab says, no more. We're going to cut that gravy train off. We're not going to do that because I am not going to be subjected to the son of Ahab. Well, uh, then Jehoram gets, uh, gets wind of this and he, gets, uh, he musters, they said, an army in all Israel. Then he goes to Jehoshaphat. You've heard of Jehoshaphat. Uh, and he goes to Jehoshaphat and he said, would you go with me? Because the king of Moab has rebelled against me. And so Jehoshaphat says, my horses are as your horses, my men are as your men, and yes, I will go with you. And so they go, and I will take up the story in 2 Kings chapter 3 and verse number 6. So King Jehoram went out and at, of Samaria at the time and mustered all Israel. Then he went and sent to Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, saying, the king of Moab has rebelled against me. Will you go with me to fight against Moab? And he said, I will go. I am as you are, my people as your people, and my horses as your horses. Then he said, now this is Jehoshaphat asking Jehoram. He said, which way shall we go? And he answered, by way of the wilderness of Edom. So the king of Israel went with the king of Judah and the king of Edom, and they marched on that roundabout route seven days, and there was no water for the army, nor for the animals that followed them. And the king of Israel said, Alas, for the Lord has caused these three kings together to deliver them in the hand of Moab. I want to see there's three principles. Now we're going to get to the rest of the story because there is a positive end to this story. But I want you to understand there's three things I want you to see right in this, at this point right here is that one, we need as believers, we need to 
be careful in whom we associate with, in whom we connect with, in whom we partnership with. Because the, peop- the Bible tells us in the New Testament that we should not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. You see, a, 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 the man of God, the man who God chose, Jehoshaphat, should never have linked himself up with the, the son of a wicked king who in turn became a wicked king. And so he should never have attached himself to that situation and said, I will be as you are. Now I want you to know this. We also have to be careful when we are uh, connected with others. We need to know their motive. We need to know their uh, th- th- their directive. We need to know their agenda. You see, uh, all Jehoram told Jehoshaphat was that the king of Moab had rebelled against him and they're going to quell that rebellion. What he didn't say was there was some pride involved. There was some greed involved. Uh, And so he was wanting someone to come into his assistance to do something that was unscriptural, that was not based on God's direction. And so when we find that out, when we find ourselves in that place, then there is going to be some potential challenges and there's a mess involved. In other words, when they went about this long trip, now you got to know the, 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 the players here. Uh, king Jehoram was uh, the king of Israel, but you remember Edom? He said the king of Edom went with. They went through that community. You got to know that Edom was also the descendants of Esau. You remember Esau. Esau was Isaac's son, the rebellious son. He was the one who married all these foreign women, who who did that in spite of, uh, to spite his mother and his father. He's the one that sold his birthright. And so when we think of Edom, we don't recognize, but that is uh, uh, the descendants, Edom is the descendants of Esau. So Jehoshaphat has aligned himself with a wicked king and a rebellious people, and he's expecting God to bless him. Well, God can't, can't bless us the fully when we align ourselves with the wrong motive, with the wrong people. And so, uh, I, but I also want you to understand that God makes plain a man's heart. Nevertheless, the Lord counsel is what we need. Now, when that happens, and listen, sometimes we get deceived. Sometimes we connect with others and it just looks good, feels good on the surface. But when we get into it, see, they went around the about way. Seven days, they found no water. And so there's a problem. And so the king of Israel begins to say, the Lord brought us all together to defeat us at the hand of Moab. Negative statements about what position you're in will never get you to the right place. So I want you to understand that God always has a way out, even when we must make a mistake and we have a difficulty, when we are in a place, God will always, he'll either turn the situation around for us or he will bring us through where there's no harm and no damage done to us. How many of us would say, we have connected with the wrong people. We have connected sometimes in, in things we thought were good. I can tell you, I can go and list several things in my life. But thank God when, when the situation got worse and we recognized and the Spirit of God revealed to us what the, that, our, that our alignment was wrong, that he delivered us. Amen. And so sometimes, however, that requires some effort. It doesn't always happen overnight, and it requires some effort. So let's keep reading. In verse number 11, verse number 10, the king of Israel is making a defeated statement. Alas, oh my, this is bad news. 
God has put us all together, but we're going to be defeated by the hands of Moab. But Jehoshaphat said, is there no prophet here that we may inquire of the Lord by him? So, of, so one of the servants of the king of Israel answered and said, Elisha, the son of uh, Saphrath is here who poured water on the hands of Elijah. And Jehoshaphat said, the word of the Lord is with him. So the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat and the king of Edom went down to him. Now notice verse 13 is real interesting. And, the, and Elisha said to the king of Israel, what have I to do with you? Go to the prophets of your fathers, the prophets of your mother. But the king of Israel said, No, for the Lord has called these three, thing, these three kings together to deliver them into the hands of Moab. He's still on that negative kick. So Elisha says, As the Lord of hosts lives before whom I stand, surely what, where, were it not that I regarded the presence of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, I would not look at you, nor would I see you. In other words, the king, the Lord is going to give you some instructions despite perhaps some uh, ill-advised alignments, some ill-advised connections, some ill-advised uh, partnerships that you might be in. God's going to speak to you because of you. Because your heart is right. Because you've given your heart to God. Because you want to serve him. And I believe Jehoshaphat was right. I believe he was just misguided at that moment. And notice what he says here. Bring me now a musician. Then it happened when the musician played that the hand of the Lord came upon him. And he said, thus saith the Lord, make this valley full of ditches. I thought, you know, this is not a story that you'd necessarily want to remember. Not necessarily that it would make a whole lot of impact in your life. But I want you to see there are some things, some principles. Number one is that we have to be careful who we align ourselves with. Number two, be concerned about their motive and ask their agenda before we're connected with them. And know that even though it's a difficult situation, God can always bring us through. But in this case, they went to get some instructions. They want to know they are in a mess. Sometimes when you're in a mess, you got you to gotta step back. You got to take a step back and say, okay, wait a minute. We are here. This is where we are. We can't go back and undo it. So where do we go forward from here? Where do we go from this point? And so they call for the man of God. And he said this, sometimes we got to get some instructions from a spiritual realm, some instructions from the word of God, get some instructions. You know, the Bible says in Proverbs 16, 16, how much better to get wisdom than gold and to get understanding is to be chosen rather than silver. So, in other words, he says that sometimes we just need some wisdom. We need some understanding. We need some direction. And so he got the, the man of God to come and he brought a musician. And so I, I, I thought about that and think about it, that a musician is one who was coming. And as he began to play, the anointing, the hand of the Lord came upon the prophet. We got to know that sometimes when we come in to praise and worship, listen, praise and worship isn't a prelude for the word. Praise and worship is a place that we come into, ought to come into so that we can develop and, and, and create an atmosphere for the anointing, an atmosphere for the presence of God, an atmosphere for the power of God to go forth and to, and to do what it's necessary to do. And so sometimes when we get the instructions, we get the instructions in many different directions. We might get instructions, we might get directions from, from God through his word, through his teaching. Sometimes just listening to the word, listening to a message, suddenly there's one phrase, one sentence, one, one point that just speaks to you and it just sticks out above everything else. Why? Because it gives you some instruction. It gives you some direction for your life or direction or the the situation that you find yourself in at that moment. 
Sometimes it's simply by the, by the Spirit of God that He leads us. Sometimes there's something on the inside of us uh, that just says, you know, something's not right, something's not correct, I don't know what it is, but you just feel, Brother Hagin used to say it's like taking a shower with your socks on. I've never tried that to see what it feels like. I, sometimes I thought maybe just taking a bath with my socks on, see how that would work. No, uh, I've never done that. But you know, it's just this uncomfortable feeling. Something's not quite right. And the Holy Spirit will, will begin to give you some instructions on, on some things in your life because he's there. You remember Jesus said that he'll guide you to all the truth. Now, he will always bring back to remembrance what Jesus said. Well, we have the whole Word of God. And as you study it, as you read it, as you take it in, the Holy Spirit has something to bring back to your remembrance. And he'll bring those things to you that you need in your life. And so sometimes it's the voice of the Holy Spirit. Sometimes it's the voice of the Word. Sometimes it's just the voice of your conscience. Have you ever, you know, been doing something and all of a sudden you hear this voice inside your head? And you know... I shouldn't be doing this. Or I ought to go this way. Isaiah said it this way. You'll be in a direction and you hear a voice from behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it. And so sometimes it's just a voice on the inside. Sometimes it's called our conscience. It's the voice of the Holy Spirit. He will guide you to all the truth. And so when you find yourself in a mess... Sometimes you got to connect with the Holy Ghost uh, and, and so that he can express and give you some instructions to get you out of that mess. Amen. And then uh, also there's sometimes when uh, God will give us visions. He'll give us some dreams. Sometimes he'll give us uh, 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 angels that can instruct us. And the word is full of individuals who've been led by dreams. Thank God Joseph paid attention to the vision and the dreams uh, when Mary was, was expecting. Uh, thank God that uh, Joseph in the Old Testament could interpret dreams. God can lead us in those directions. Don't discount your dreams. Don't discount when God speaks to you, when it's just something completely out of the ordinary. D write it down because God's trying to speak to you concerning your future, concerning some things in your life. And then lastly, he'll also speak to you through the man of God. Amen. Now, I believe that every person needs a man of God. I believe, and, and I say that, a man of God, I believe every person needs a pastor. That, that, that you are, are allowing the Lord to speak to your heart through your pastor. Uh, and, and certainly it needs to be a man of integrity, a man of honor, and so forth. But uh, it's someone that you can say, and, and you come on a Sunday morning or whenever you listen uh, to a message, you just say, God, speak to my heart. Something that I need today. And so sometimes he'll give you some specific instructions, as was the case in this, in this case. There were some specific things that they needed to do. Sometimes it's general. Sometimes there isn't anything real specific. But you got to realize that where there is no counsel, the people fall. Proverbs 11, verse 24. But in the multitude of counselors, there's safety. There's sometimes that I just need to uh, voice where I'm heading, voice my concerns, voice what's going on in my life so that I can get some counsel uh, by the Spirit of God. Trust that it's going to be godly counsel. Now, I will say this, that, that you, you trust that what you're getting is right from the Spirit of God, is is uh, is is according to what God wants for you at that moment in your life. But because we are, and pastors and, and, and ministers are humans, we have to judge it always by the Word. 
Always go back to the Word and be sure that it lines up with the Word. Because there are some times that uh, we may say some things that are uh, uh, maybe not for you at that moment. If it's not, you put it on the shelf until God releases you with it. Amen. Now, we said this. He brought in a, a musician. And so praise ushers in the presence of God. And so it's important when, when you are in that position, you find yourself uh, in, in a, between a rock and a hard place. It's not the time just to look for answers. It's the time to spend some time in praise. Get into the presence of the Spirit of God. And through that, you begin to uh, have uh, the anointing come upon that decision, upon that life. You notice it says that the hand of the Lord came upon Elisha, and then he gave them some instructions. We see that hand of the Lord on a number of different places through the Bible where individuals were anointed for a specific task at a specific time, and they began to do some things uh, that God instructed them to do. Amen? Now, uh, you, you have to understand that sometimes uh, it might look like it is a difficult thing to do. He says here, uh, to go ahead and, and uh, verse 18, it says, and this is a simple matter in the sight of the Lord. Well, verse, let's back up to verse 17. For thus says the Lord, you shall not see wind, nor shall you see rain, yet that valley shall be filled with water, so that you, your cattle, and your animals may drink. And this is a simple matter in the sight of the Lord. He will also deliver the Moabites into your hand. Now, think about this a little bit. The, the, the word of the Lord came, through the prophet, and he said, make the valley full of ditches. And uh, that was his instructions. And he said, uh, it hasn't rained. It's not going to rain. There's not going to be any wind. And yet the ditches are going to be full of water. Well, that would have to be a miracle, wouldn't it? Uh, that that would have. I don't know where the water came from. I got to thinking, you know, you dig a little hole in South Louisiana uh, and you leave it for a while. In fact, there's a, there's a test that the Metro Code has you do to determine uh, uh, the, 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 the consistency of your soil. You dig a hole one foot deep, one foot square, and leave it 24 hours. And a lot of times there'll be water in that hole. So I don't know that that was the case back there or not, but I know that it's possible that they were digging ditches and so this water just came up. Notice he said, it's a little thing. It's not a hard thing. You know, the circumstances and the, the problems that we find ourselves in in our life are all small to God. They're only big to us. You know, but they're little things to God because with God, all things are possible. In Jeremiah 32, verse 11, he said, is there anything too hard for me? Uh, he basically says, there's nothing too hard for God. And so here's the people of God in a dire situation. And uh, the instructions of, of the Lord through the prophet was make the valley full of dishes. Now, you got to understand that sometimes God's instructions don't always make sense. They just don't always make sense. They're not always logical. Sometimes his instructions are, are just a little bit strange. Uh, why would he tell the nation of Israel to march around a city seven times for seven days and not say a word? And then on the seventh day, march around seven times, and then at the end of the seventh time to shout. Well, that doesn't make a lot of sense. Uh, why would the Spirit of God, through the same prophet, tell a man who's full of leprosy, well, just go take a bath in a dirty river. Sends him to the River Jordan. And he said, man, there's cleaner rivers in, in Syria where I come from. That doesn't make any sense. Why would Jesus put some mud in a man's eye? 
and then go tell him to wash in the pool of Siloam. Doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Uh, and, and yet God can do uh, those things through us. God's instructions are not, don't always make sense, but I want you to notice they're always doable. It's not something that is impossible for you to do. You see, you got to realize that God doesn't think like we think. God sees the past, the present, and the future all in one panoramic picture. He doesn't see it as the past, the present, and the future. In God's eyes, everything is now present. You see, God is always trying to position you for victory. He's always trying to position you for success. He's always trying to position you so that when you need that miracle, you're in position. He's always trying to position you for your breakthrough. He's always trying to get you in the right place at the right time. Notice he said, make the valley full of ditches. Well, uh, apparently, they've been walking for seven days. They ran out of water, couldn't find any water, and there's a dry creek bed. Have you ever tried to dig in a creek bed? Have you ever tried to dig in dirt that is so dry it's all cracked? It is hard. You better have a sharp shovel or a backhoe one to, to, to do something. And so realizing that what it is, what we have here is that the ground is cracked, it's parched, it's dry, it's hard, and it's hot. And I'm asking you, and you haven't had any water in seven days, or you've drunk all the water that you came out with, and now I'm asking you to go out and sweat some more in order Make ditches in this land. Now, you see, I believe Jehoshaphat could have avoided all of that. If he had not aligned himself with the king of Israel, not aligned himself with the king of Edom, he'd still be back in his palace in Judah. And, and, and this, was, this was Israel's fight, not Je Jehoshaphat's fight. But because Jehoshaphat's the man of God, God's going to see a way for him to get his man to succeed, but it's going to cost him something. There's going to be some effort involved. There's going to be some digging involved. There's going to be some hard work involved. And sometimes when we find ourselves in that place uh, that we've not been obedient to the Spirit of God, not been following His directions, that He'll get us out all right, but sometimes it won't be easy. It's easy for God. <laughs> it might not be easy for us. And so there's some hard work involved. Sometimes when we hear the... I, I hear my dad's voice on occasion. My dad passed away 30 years ago last uh, in July. But I hear him make this statement. Whenever there's something that you have to do, you know you have to do it, but you don't want to do it, just tie your heart and do it. I heard him say that. I can still hear his voice. The strange thing is I hear his voice coming out of my mouth sometimes. I hear his words coming out of my mouth sometimes. That's kind of scary. Uh, but he said, just tie your heart and do it. In other words, there's some times that Christians w talk themselves out of their miracle because they don't want to put in the effort that God tells them to put in. And sometimes we can't give a lot of brain time to, to, to the, what God has asked us to do. Because we can think ourselves out of it. Think ourselves out of that breakthrough. Think ourselves out. Well, now that doesn't make any sense. God would never ask me to do that. Well, now I don't know about that. You see, sometimes the Spirit of God will ask us to do some things that just may seem a little bit out of character. But yet, the Spirit of God will direct us. So I can't give too much brain, I can't give too much brain time to it. I just simply tie my heart and get busy doing what the Spirit of God tells me to do. When you get away from the instructions, 
you get away from the anointing. And sometimes there'll be those who are well-meaning and they'll try to talk you out of the instructions that the Spirit of God has given you. If those instructions are not immoral, illegal, or unethical, and, and, and they're following the, the pattern of the Word, then you follow those instructions and you let the Spirit of God direct you. Amen? And so, so that you're not pulling away from the anointing. Now watch this. Sometimes God may be having, may have you busy in one place. See, I believe God had him digging ditches right there. But he was working on something over here to get the water over here. But if I'm not working over here, or if I'm over there, but God says to be here, then God is working over here, expecting me to be right here, but I'm over there, then I'm going to miss my miracle. I'm going to miss my breakthrough. I'm going miss, to miss the anointing of what God wants me to do. So sometimes God has me in a place because he's working behind the scenes somewhere that I can't see him work. But I got to trust that he's telling me to dig these ditches. The title of today's message, I'm just digging ditches. Somebody say, well, you know, you know, uneducated people dig ditches. Now, I tell you what, di ditch diggers are making lots of money these days. But I tell you, I would prefer being digging my ditch where God tells me to dig and be hot and be sweaty and, 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 and know that God has instructed me to do that than to be in a place where it's comfortable and it's air-conditioned and, and, and it just seems to be right. Uh, and yet God says, I will meet you where I told you I would meet you. Now watch this. Sometimes God has you busy today. Because he's working on your tomorrows. Sometimes he's got you busy doing the little things that just seem to be busy work. It's, it doesn't make any sense. You remember, you remember the karate kid? You know, wax on, wax off. Paint it this way and paint it that way. Wax on, wax off. Just seemed to be busy work. Seemed like all Mr. Miyagi was doing was getting Daniel's son to wax his car and to paint his fence. But when the rubber met the road, uh, 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 yeah, I got one hand busy. Yeah, Keith, Keith's got it right. One hand this way and the other hand that way. I can't do it with my... It just looked like he had him doing busy work. Stuff he didn't want to do himself. He had Daniel's son do it. But when the battle showed up and the battle of life showed up, Daniel's son knew how to block the punches. And he knew how to keep the kicks down. And he knew what to do. Why? Because he practiced. Sometimes God has you doing some little things today that don't make a lot of sense because he's working on your tomorrows. And he's preparing you for sometimes the battles that come. And he's got you in the Word, and it seems like, my goodness, i got to spend more time in the Word. I've read this over again. I've read this passage before. I've read the New Testament a hundred times. I've read Psalms. I read Psalms and Proverbs. I read Psalms through in a month. I, uh, no, not a month. In a quarter. I read Proverbs through in a month, and I've read the Proverbs 12 times a year for the last 25 years. And every time I read it, it's like it's still something new. It's still something different. And and I read the Old Testament and I read the New Testament and it's like, where did that come from? I didn't see that before. What am I doing? It seems like busy work. But when the battles come, God's working on my tomorrows so that I can succeed tomorrow. Hallelujah. Let me find out where I was here. Sometimes God tells you to sow a seed and you don't have much seed. But he's like, Isaac, 
he sowed a seed in a famine, and you reap a harvest in that same year when it doesn't seem like anybody else is sowing seed. It doesn't make sense, and yet God says, you do it. Moses was instructed to lift up the staff, and he said, don't cry to me. God said to him, don't cry to me. Lift up the staff, part the Red Sea. Sometimes God gives you some instructions that don't always make sense, but they're always doable. A 17-year-old boy by the name of David was faced with a nine-foot giant by the name of Goliath. Goliath made David the king. God instructed David by the Spirit how to attack that giant. And it wasn't, and you know, we, we hear the stories. We, we, we see uh, circumstances, and even in today, uh, somebody will say, this was a true David and Goliath battle. It goes down in history as being the best. Now, the water came up through Edom. Remember, that's where they came from. Now, how did the water get in the ditches? I don't know. I want to see the video when I get to heaven. I don't know how the water got there. But you got to understand, how many of you ever been uh, on, a, on a, a lake or near a lake early in the morning or late in the evening and when the sun is just coming up or the sun is just going down and you can look across that lake and it just glistens? There's just this glistening of, this, of this, this water. I've been there a couple of times early in the morning going fishing, and, and, and I'm in my boat, and, and I'm there before the sun rises, and I'm thinking I got here too early and because I don't have a light in my boat, and I can't really see where I'm going, and there's stumps out there, so I'm going to wait till the sun comes up. And boy, you can see it, and the sun comes up, and it just glistens. It's beautiful. I believe the Israelite army and, and Jehoshaphat and, and, and uh, Jehoram and the king of Edom were waiting that next morning because they spent all that previous day or the previous several days digging ditches and the prophet says that they would be full of water. And so now they're waiting to see, is it going to happen? Is it going to take place? And when it came up, the sun came up, it was red. And the nation of Moab says, oh, those are the foolish kings have killed themselves. They went into battle against each other. And so they laid their guard down. And they said, we're just going to go get the spoils. And when they came in, the nation of Israel was ready for them. And so they were defeated right there. But I want you, I don't, I don't know how the water got there. But I do know that God is setting the enemy up for destruction in your life. He is setting you up for success. He's setting you up in the battles so that the enemy can be confused and can be defeated in your life. Amen. If you believe that, say amen. amen. Now this morning, we're going to share communion with you. It's our communion Sunday. We do it uh, uh, the, first of, the first of the month. And what I want you to do this morning is sometimes, you know, we will look at communion and, and we'll have a whole communion message. But this is a point where we can commit ourselves to listening to the voice of the Spirit. Whatever circumstance we find in our life, wherever we find ourselves this morning, God wants to work a way for you to come out. If it's not a pleasant place, if it's not an easy place, God has a way for you to come out. Maybe it's some decisions that you've made. Maybe it's a, a place that you've, you, you, you were rebellious and you went one direction and you know that you shouldn't have, but you're here this morning. God says, I've got some better instructions for you. I've got a better place for you. And, and I want to bring you to that place. So this morning, uh, as we receive communion,
This was Jesus' final commitment to the body of Christ, to, to, the, to, to the world. I'm giving you a way out. I am, I am forming a bridge with two boards and three nails. I'm forming a bridge for you to come out of a natural lifestyle into a spiritual life. And so uh, he's giving us that avenue this morning. So uh, you don't have to be a member of Living Glory Church to receive communion with us. All we ask is that you be a member of the body of Christ, that you be born again, having made Jesus the Lord of your life. And so as the ushers are going to get the children and they're going to bring them back in, I want to ask you, if you're here this morning, but you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life, you don't know that if today were your last day, today you would pass on from this life, where would you spend eternity? Would you spend eternity with God? Would you be in his presence? Or would you be cast out into the lake of fire? Basically, God doesn't send anybody there, but people go there because they have not made Jesus the Lord of their life. They choose to go in the opposite direction because they haven't accepted what God has done for them through Jesus. And so the question that we'll have all have to face in our life is, what did we do with Jesus? What did we do with his sacrifice? If we've accepted it and made it our own, then he ushers us in to his presence, and he becomes our king.